No. Turkey fan of the turkey is not what's making you tired after a big meal. No cliffhangers. Let's just get straight to some metabolic myth busting. You probably heard that myth, yes, myth, that eating turkey at Thanksgiving makes you sleepy afterwards. And it makes you sleepy afterwards because turkey has a lot of the amino acid tryptophan. And tryptophan can be used to make the neurotransmitter serotonin, which is known for like mood and stuff, effects on mood, a little bit on sleepiness and things, and melatonin, which is really associated with that sleepiness. And so tryptophan can be made, can be used to make these Neurotransmitter, so serotonin is a neurotransmitter, meaning it gets released directly from a nerve to its target cell. And melatonin, this hormone, which a hormone, it gets secreted into the bloodstream. And melatonin, it's associated with making you sleepy. So it makes sense that, well, turkey has a lot of tryptophan, and tryptophan is used to make these hormones and neurotransmitters, and these make you sleepy. Well, then, eating a bunch of tryptophan, eating a bunch of turkey, therefore should make you sleepy. There are a few problems with this. One is that turkey does not have more tryptophan than other foods, and so you can see that it's pretty similar to other forms of animal protein, and it's less than some things like your cheese, less than soybeans. So soybeans have way more tryptophan, and if we think about it on like a percent-wise ratio, your soybeans are going to have like 1.62% of the tryptophan per protein, and turkey is only 1.1%. Which, both of those are really low percent. And this is going to come into play because, well, your tryptophan is going to have to compete with other amino acids, all those other amino acids making up the proteins, in order to actually get into cells. And tryptophan is not very good at that competition. So, basically, you eat a bunch of turkey, you get some tryptophan. You eat a bunch of cheese, you get some tryptophan. You eat a bunch of sesame seeds, you get some tryptophan. But you get very little tryptophan compared to all the other proteins in your food. And so now that tryptophan is traveling through the bloodstream, in order to actually get made into serotonin and melatonin, however, the tryptophan doesn't just need to be in your bloodstream, it needs to get into cells, and more specifically, it needs to get into specific cells in your brain that are actually able to make these molecules. If we compare the structure of tryptophan to, say, the structure of our serotonin and the structure of our melatonin, we can see that a couple of chemical changes are needed. In order to carry out these chemical changes, we're going to need specialized enzymes. Enzymes such as tryptophan 5-hydroxylase and dopa decarboxylase to make our serotonin, and then serotonin and acetyltransferase and acetylserotonin omethyltransferase to make our melatonin. I'm not telling you these big fancy names to scare you off or to make you think that you need to be a super duper scientist to understand all this, but rather just to say that you need specific proteins in order to make these reactions happen, to make these modifications happen, and these proteins are only going to be located in very specialized cells. When you digest those proteins, now they're in your digestive tract and the tryptophan from them has to get through the bloodstream to your brain. We're going to be talking about a couple of different places, and so the serotonin can be made in various places, but in particular, the melatonin is going to be made mostly in this pineal gland, this little gland in your brain, as well as some in the intestines and the retina. The pineal gland, unlike the regions of your brain that are like making your serotonin, the pineal gland is not going to be protected by a blood-brain barrier. And so the blood-brain barrier is this kind of collection of cells that are kind of tightly knit together. They are make this barrier that is hard to get things through. And this is going to make it so your brain is protected. It's also going to make it so that there's kind of different competition facing molecules trying to get into your brain than those molecules throughout your bloodstream. And this will make a little more sense, hopefully, in a minute. But your pineal gland is not protected by that. In order to actually get to your brain, the tryptophan is going to be having to travel through the blood. If we look at the structure of tryptophan, we see that it's going to be it's mostly hydrophobic. And so it's going to have these hydrocarbon parts that aren't really offering anything for the water to hang out with. Water likes to hang out with things that are hydrophilic, things that have charge or partial charge, not things that are hydrophobic, things that are mostly hydrocarbon. So that tryptophan isn't just going to be free floating through your bloodstream very well. Instead, it's going to glob onto this protein serum albumin. 
If you've worked in a lab, you might have heard of bovine serum albumin, which is the cow version of this. It's this protein that's very, very abundant in the bloodstream, which is why it makes a nice, cheap, ready source of protein for lab experiments when you just want a generic protein. And well, when you just want a kind of generic blob protein in your bloodstream, human serum albumin is good for this. It's got all these hydrophobic parts that are able to glob onto hydrophobic things and therefore kind of hide them from the water and allow them to transport through the bloodstream. A hydrophobic effect says that water is going to avoid hanging out with the hydrophobic things in order to maximize its favorable interactions. This is going to cluster the hydrophobic things together, and it's going to make it so that, say, your fatty acids are going to glob onto albumin to give them transport through the bloodstream. Because your fatty acids, so the fats, if you want to get the energy from those fats to other cells, well, you can't just make globs of fat just go through the bloodstream. Instead, you put the fatty acids, kind of have them hide on the serum albumin, glob onto the serum albumin, and then get to cells that way. Similarly, our tryptophan is going to glob onto the serum albumin and travel through the bloodstream this way. Tryptophan is kind of unique in doing this. Your other amino acids aren't. going to do this. And so what this means is a tryptophan is kind of hidden from the cells on its way to the brain. And on its way to the brain, there's going to be cells with transporters for taking in amino acids. And some of those amino acid transporters are going to take in tryptophan. Tryptophan is going to be competing with other amino acids to get into those cells, however. And the tryptophan is going to be at a couple of disadvantages. One is that it's tied up in that serum albumin, and another is that those transporters in the cells throughout your body don't have that high of affinity for the tryptophan. So they're going to preferentially take in other amino acids. When it comes to these amino acid transporters, your tryptophan is competing with other kind of big nonpolar ones or neutral ones. Basically, these large neutral amino acids transporters, LNAA transporters, they're also going to let in tryptophan. phenylalanine, tyrosine, leucine, valine, isoleucine, methionine, some will let in histine, histidine, depends where you kind of look. So all these amino acids are going to be competing to get into those cells, and your tryptophan is not going to be very good at competing for them. So these other amino acids are going to be preferentially taken in, and this is actually going to take away the competition from your tryptophan so that when you reach the blood-brain barrier, When you reach the regions that are able to make the serotonin, well, now those other amino acids have been taken away. And so you're going to have more of the tryptophan available to actually get into your brain to be made to make serotonin. But all of that is kind of assuming that you are going to be making more of those LNAA transporters. You're able to kind of increase the decrease of those other amino acids, because if you're not removing these other amino acids on your way to the brain, then you're not going to be having that decreased competition. If you were to just let these all hang out in your bloodstream and travel to the brain, well, now you're, you're going to have the same competition there as you had before. So in order to selectively remove these other amino acids, we would need to increase the kind of making of these LNAA transporters throughout the rest of your body, say in your muscle cells, to let in those amino acids and let the tryptophan kind of lose its competition. How can we do this? How can we increase the uptake of these other amino acids? This is a hypothesis called the Wortman effect. What this is says is that basically when you eat carbohydrates along with that protein, because you're probably not just eating turkey, right? You're, you're probably not just eating cheese. You're not eating just sesame seeds. Instead, you're eating some meal with a lot of different components. And one of those components is probably carbohydrates. So like your starches and your sugars. What those do is they trigger the release of a hormone called insulin. Now, insulin, you might have heard about it in relationship to like diabetes. Basically, what insulin does is, well, it does a lot of things. But one of the things it does is it helps you regulate your blood glucose, so your blood sugar, by when you have high blood sugar, like right after a meal, your pancreas releases this insulin. This insulin tells cells to let the glucose in, let's store it, let's use it, let's do all these things. And it's also going to tell the cells let in amino acids. And so it's going to tell the cells throughout your body, say in your muscle cells, to let in those large neutral amino acids, increase the amount of the, these other amino acids that get taken in. This is going to increase the ratio of tryptophan to these other amino acids when you reach that blood-brain barrier. Now when you reach the blood-brain barrier, 
the serum albumin that the tryptophan is being carried on can't get in. So now when the tryptophan comes off of that serum albumin, it can sneak into the brain. You have higher affinity transporters there. You have less competition there. And you're not going to be kind of hidden on this serum albumin. So voila, you get more tryptophan taken into those cells, and you can therefore have more serotonin made. And this might then contribute to a little bit of uh, positive happy mood as well as a little bit of sleepiness. I say it might. There's very, very sketchy evidence for this. And so basically, general media articles often recommend diets and foods to increase blood tryptophan levels and raise brain serotonin levels. Such recommendations are not supported by scientific studies. And so, yeah, very, very little evidence. And so, but that's just the hypothesis and I want you to introduce to you. That was for making serotonin. If we talk about sleepiness, here we're often, the main focus is going to be our melatonin. The melatonin, that was the one where I was saying that was going to be made in this little pineal gland. Also some in your intestines, as well as like your retina. But if we think about the bulk of it, that's going to be in your pineal gland. And your pineal gland is not going to be protected by the blood-brain barrier. Which means your pineal gland is going to be facing the same kind of like situation as the rest of the cells throughout the body. Where the tryptophan is going to be tied up in the serum albumin. It's going to be competing with those other um, large neutral amino acids. You're not going to have that kind of same proportion-wise boost of the tryptophan as you would have at your blood-brain barrier. So you're not getting that bump in the increased tryptophan to the pineal gland, which is where the melatonin is actually made. So that even if you believe that whole hypothesis about the insulin allowing you to get better uptake of tryptophan into your brain to make the serotonin, that's not going to be getting more tryptophan into your pineal gland to make the melatonin. So myth busted. Don't get me wrong, I'm not doubting that you're tired after that meal, but I'm saying that that turkey tryptophan is not what's making you tired. So what might be making you tired? If you think about the fight or flight response, that's what we call the sympathetic nervous system. And so you have some stress inducing situation and you see a bear or something, you need to, your body needs to prepare to either fight from it or flee it. And so you're going to do things associated with that. The kind of opposite of that is the parasympathetic nervous system, rest and digest. So fight or flight, sympathetic, rest and digest, parasympathetic. As the name suggests, well, rest and digest. And when you're digesting food, that takes a lot of energy and it kind of makes you all sleepy. And your body, it's like, okay, well, let's just kind of put more blood flow through the guts. Let's focus on digesting and then the rest of your body can do some resting. And so... By kind of prioritizing the rest and digest, your body goes to sleep, <laughs> or at least you feel sleepy. You might not be able to go to sleep quite yet. There's also the effects of alcohol that can be having an effect if that is something that you had partaked in. So bottom line, things are complicated. It's not the turkey's fault, not just because you're eating it and it's kind of adding insult to injury to then blame it for your tiredness. The turkey does not have more tryptophan than other foods. The tryptophan in the food is competing to get into cells with other amino acids, and it's kind of bad at that competition. It can get a boost when you have carbohydrates along with that meal. The carbohydrates is going to lead to the secretion of a hormone called insulin from your pancreas. Insulin is going to cause cells to make more of the amino acid transporters that would let tryptophan into the cells. Those transporters prefer other amino acids, so those transporters are going to preferentially let those other amino acids into the cells. This is going to decrease the competition for your tryptophan. Tryptophan in the bloodstream is going to be traveling on a protein called serum albumin. It's going to be kind of hidden in that serum albumin protein. It's getting its competition removed as it travels through the bloodstream to the brain. When it reaches the brain, well, now it's got an advantage because the other amino acids have kind of been taken away, and there are now higher affinity tryptophan transporters. These tryptophan transporters are then going to give it a boost into the brain, and this might, 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 might lead to the production of some more serotonin, which is associated with like a positive mood and a bit with sleepiness. The evidence for this is not so strong especially not compared to what's often been told. 
if you think about sleepiness, well, now you're talking about melatonin for the main part. Melatonin, it's only made in specific parts of your brain, as well as a little bit in your intestines and your retina. But that pineal gland, well, it's not protected by the blood-brain barrier. And so it's facing that kind of same blood supply as the rest of the body, where you had all those other amino acids competing with the tryptophan to get into cells. So you're not going to get that boost of tryptophan into your pineal gland, and you're not going to therefore be able to make more melatonin, even though you ingested more tryptophan, and even if you had that boost from the insulin. The main cause for your sleepiness is probably just that you ate a big meal, you're digesting, you're doing the resting that goes along with the digestion.